Um, so, uh, good morning. My, my name is David Lawson. Uh, as introduced today, I'm going to take you in four different areas. So, uh, it, there will be some career advice. Uh, there will be some advice about starting businesses. I want to talk to you about Austrade uh, and what we do at Austrade. And uh, I also want to touch on, uh, uh, because I understand you've read it, uh, Australia in the Asian Century, uh, an interesting policy that was put together by the Gillard government. Um, and uh, uh, th there's some interesting thinking in that, which I'd like to just take you through uh, and uh, uh, explore some of those concepts a bit. The um, slide didn't progress. Yeah, the slide progressed. Uh, uh, so Austrade is all about, it's a federal government agency and it's all about helping Australians export. Well, why would we need to help Australian companies export? Uh, and these are some of the reasons. Um, exporting, the export sector or um, portion of the uh, economy is vital to Australia. 20% uh, of the Australian GDP is actually derived from our exports. The, uh, I, I believe these slides you can scribble down furiously if you like, that's fine, but I think the slides will be made available afterwards as well. But uh, the, the fact that, uh, that one uh, in seven Australian jobs is directly uh, related to some aspect of exporting. Um, I'll, the next slide will give you a little bit of an indication of the, of the share of, or the portion of each sector within the export uh, business, but would anyone know what our biggest export sector is? I, I give no prizes, you just have the pride of knowing... It would be like natural resources. Isn't it, it would be natural resources, but I just want to point out to you that uh, services is an enormous part of the Australian uh, uh, international business engagement. And of that, something like uh, uh, 15, uh, um, 15 billion dollars is just with uh, education uh, exports. So here's that, uh, that breakdown, the analysis there. So as I mentioned, $51.2 billion or 17% of all Australian exports are in the services sector of which uh, 15 billion is in the education alone. Um, resources, minerals and fuels obviously are the biggest and, and gold looms large there. The interesting thing about services though is that a lot of service exports are hidden. Uh, we don't know, we can't, we, we can't uh, measure the work that a, uh, an architectural design uh, expert living on the Gold Coast, uh, who's, all of whose clients are in China, you, you know, we can't measure the exports there. My own wife runs a translation business. Uh, wherever she is in the world, uh, all her clients are in Japan. And uh, you know, there's no way statistically uh, to determine uh, what contribution she is making, but she's an exporter. All of her, uh, all of her income is derived uh, from, uh, from, from overseas. Um, this picture gives you an idea of where our exports go at the moment. And it's not always looked like this, obviously, when uh, when Australia was founded in the Federation in 1901, 55% of our exports went to, uh, went to the UK. Uh, and those were the days when we rode on the sheep's back. So it was our high quality wool and our wheat exports going to the UK, which dominated uh, all of our trade. Interestingly, our next biggest export market was the United States. Uh, you may not be aware, but uh, the Californian gold rush uh, in the mid-1800s uh, around San Francisco uh, was actually fueled by coal that came from Newcastle here in New South Wales and that was really the opening of, uh, of trade between, uh, between Australia and the US. Um, curiously, a lot of um, former Australian convicts saw this as an opportunity to get out of Australia and crewed those ships, as those, uh, those coal ships, as they went over to San Francisco. When they arrived in San Francisco, they jumped ship, went off to the gold fields of San Francisco, left all these deserted boats in the Bay of San Francisco. The next time you're at San Francisco, 
underneath Coit Tower, uh, where the Levi's uh, headquarters is. Uh, that used to be called Sydney Cove because all the boats from Sydney were all abandoned there and, and a bunch of uh, ne'er-do-well former Australian convicts sort of set up shop there with brothels and illegal bars and things like that, looked after these ships and, and some of those ships sort of became the landfill which, which is, uh, is now part of California. So Australian exports have a big impact in surprising places. Um, so that was 1901. 50 years later, uh, not a lot had changed. The UK and the US were, were still our top three, uh, our top two trading partners. France was number three. Um, and, and that represented over 50% of Australian exports. Um, we, our, our trade by this stage had, to Asia had grown. We're up to about 15% of our trade was going to, uh, was going to Asia. Um, Japan, India and Malaysia had, had sort of snuck into the top 10. But over the 60 years that, uh, that precede 2010, Australia's training relationships really shifted to, uh, to Asia. So it was during that time, after the war, that we, that we shifted and, and started uh, uh, growing our exports to, to Asia. By 1971, in fact, uh, um, exports to Asia uh, approximated about 30% of, of all of our trade. Japan had been, become our largest trading partner. Um, it's interesting to note that in 1957, the, uh, the um, uh, Australia, the, the Menzies government, signed a, a trade deal with uh, Japan, and that uh, our Prime Minister, I don't know if you saw the news last night, that the Prime Minister was referring to that as one of the cornerstones which really helped to drive the growth of the exports of our uh, iron ore industry, our coal industry, as Japan built itself up after the uh, Second World War, uh, we really grew our exports on the back of that trade deal. So it's, uh, it's quite momentous that we've just signed an, or, or just agreed on on the terms of another trade deal with Japan. Uh, moving on, and, and uh, by 1981, China had made it to our top 10 trading partner, and our two-rate trade with Asia was now around about 40%. Uh, in 1991, it wasn't until 1991 that Korea joined our top 10 trading partners. Uh, it's now our fifth largest trading partner. Korea, of course, was on a little bit of a lag because it was hit by the, uh, by the Korean War uh, and, and uh, rebuilding after the Korean War in, in, in the 50s. In 2010, trade with Asia accounted more than two-thirds of Australia's two-way trade. Uh, and eight nations of the Pacific were in our top ten markets for, for all of our exports. Uh, but it's important to note that that the UK and, and the US, it's not at a loss to the UK and the US, UK and the US are still major export destinations for us, it's just that everything else grew. Um, just to contextualise uh, uh, myself, um, so I finished high school in 1981 and, and finished university in 1986. Uh, after high school I was an exchange student to Japan. When I uh, came back from Japan after being an exchange student. I'd studied Japanese and French um, all, all the way through school. Uh, I went to university uh, in Canberra at the Australian National University. And um, I, I can remember being challenged in one of these lectures, and I'm going to put the challenge out to you. This university lecture, I did economics, I did Asian studies and, 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 and Japanese and, and Japanese history, but this economic development lecturer put a challenge to the class that uh, an American lecturer, uh, she said that, uh, that in the United States, most kids at university are looking at what business they can start, you know, what, what next multi-billionaire enterprise uh, they can develop themselves. In Australia, we tend to be the opposite. We look at what big company we can get a job in. Or, or what government, you know, in Canberra, where I went to university, is which department you can get in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the Australian federal government. Um, but I remember that challenge, and after uh, a couple of years as a research assistant, uh, 
uh, I decided, yep, I need to start my own business. Um, so I, I started my own business. The, uh, the idea behind my business was that the, the Japanese are always going to need three things. They're going to need food, they're going to need clothing, and they're going to need housing, shelter. So uh, I spent nine years on that business. Uh, for the first couple of years, I really tried hard to, to sell food to the Japanese. Um, but unless you're, you know, your company is something like Schweppes or, or uh, you know, a major exporter, a major company, it's really hard to get a margin there. I think the biggest thing that I ever sold was about a 20-foot container of, uh, of juice, and I made 18 cents per carton on, on a 20-foot container, which you know, amounts to less than $2,000. But it just wasn't worth my time. I was going to starve. Um, but of all the things, food, clothing, and shelter, uh, I started, I built the first Australian house in Japan. So I determined that uh, the costs of distribution in Japan were enormous uh, for building materials, for anything really, but uh, in those days the trading house imported the product, it, it took it through its own wholesale uh, system and network, and then houses were built by companies which were part of that same trading company conglomerate. So 10% was sort of added to every step of the way until it got down to the local builder actually built the house. Uh, so for roughly uh, two thirds the cost, uh, I determined that we could import directly by the builder and, and build the house. That's me in, uh, in the pink shorts there. Nick Kelly, the bush ranger, was one of the, uh, so we had a whole bunch of Australian guys um, uh, uh, building the house and, and, and that's what it ended up looking like. And, and that, uh, that 18 month, you know, 18 month old uh, number one daughter is now 23, so a little while ago. But, but that, so uh, that, that house became that. What we discovered though uh, was, was that building one house alone was, was no cheaper. Uh, and the secret to building a business was to build lots of houses together. So we would build wherever possible. Uh, we'd build, you can see the rice fields here, but reclaimed rice fields where an old farmer passed away and his family didn't want to grow rice anymore in Japan. Uh, they'd convert the land uh, and we would build 12 houses or numerous houses together with, with each element of the construction following the other one around and we, we, we achieved efficiencies there. Um, the review, you can, you can check this out later at your own, uh, at your own leisure, but the, so the value proposition was that we could break the distribution system. Market failure, where it didn't work, was that Australians weren't able to gear up, Australian material suppliers weren't able to gear up for uh, the volumes for Japan. They weren't able to achieve the quality. They were easily distracted around this time the Sydney Olympics was announced and suddenly everybody, all the builders, put their resources into building and preparing for the Sydney Olympics. So I, I you know, spent 18 months negotiating an order and then they say, oh sorry, can we delay it for six months because we've got this big order at home, which, and uh, you know, Japanese customers just won't abide that. So uh, a couple of things happened there. I, I learned a lot. I didn't make a lot of money. I didn't go bankrupt though. Uh, traded in, in surplus the whole time I ran my own business. But I also uh, ran across an organization called Austrade. Um, and uh, I quite, uh, Austrade had been, uh, I'll put some notes here I should uh, refer to. And Austrade had been around and has been around since 1933. But, uh, um, in, in, and in fact, going to this thought about the recent announcement about Australia's Asian century, I should point out that uh, our first trade commissioner actually, uh, 1921, so before the trade commissioner service was formally ratified, uh, was actually sent to Shanghai. Uh, so even back in 1921, the Australian government realised that it's difficult to export. It's a big market. We need people on the ground to help facilitate that. Um, uh, after the Trade Commissioner Service was established in 1930, or ratified in 1933, uh, the next uh, few Trade Commissioners were also in Asia. And by 19, uh, uh, 
uh, or 1930, um, Japan was one of our um, sec one of our largest export markets. I mentioned that earlier. We established offices in Tokyo, in Singapore, in Shanghai. And in fact, the fall of uh, Singapore uh, at the commencement of the Pacific War in 1942, the Australian Trade Commissioner was captured and, and executed by the Japanese. Um, by the 1960s, Austrade had a global network uh, of, of offices, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, about some of those offices. Um, a couple of other things that have been really significant, I mentioned the uh, commercial agreement that we ratified in 1957 between Australia and Japan. Another really significant thing which helped Australian trade, I should not ignore it, is the uh, closer economic relations between Australia and, and New Zealand. So uh, the Trade Commissioner uh, Service was formed. This is what we do. And uh, just to make it really easy, I've cleverly hidden the, the Austrade website in, in, in this slide for you for future reference. Lots of inf in interesting information there. But basically, we help exporters uh, get their products into overseas markets. We help attract foreign direct investment into Australia. And there's also an element of, uh, of financial assistance to exporters. So that's called the Export Market Development, Export Market, EMDG, Export Market Development Grant Scheme. So now, uh, Austrade has roughly 80 offices in, in 50 uh, countries around the world. Uh, our most recent office was opened in 2012. Uh, it was announced, actually, in the Asia Century white paper launched by Prime Minister Gillard that we would be opening an office in uh, Mongolia. In fact, I had the honour and privilege of being able to set up our office there. We had been planning a long time before the Prime Minister announced it. Um, um, you know, they, these things don't usually don't just happen. And we had been thinking, we had been circulating around Mongolia uh, and, and looking at whether we should establish an office there. But to open that office, uh, we had to adjust our budgets. Governments are limited by, uh, by the, 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 federal bu uh, the federal budget. So we'd like to have offices everywhere. There's a strong rationale and, and reasons why uh, one of our biggest trading markets, of course, is the United States. A lot of Australian companies crash and burn in the United States. Why? Because they think they know how to do business in the US because we speak the same language when, and we, we have so many uh, you know, similarities in the way we think. In fact, Culturally, business culture in Japan, in, in, in the US is very different from Japan or China or anywhere else. And, and so many Australian companies come unstuck. So I would be an advocate, having spent four years in San Francisco, for having big office and big presence in the United States. But we had to shrink that and our offices in Western Europe so that we could open offices in, in more difficult and obscure places, but places where it's critical uh, for Australian government to help uh, um, Australian exporters. Mongolia is one of those. Just as a, what, why Mongolia? Um, anyone know anything about Mongolia? Probably not. Uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the poorest nations in the world. Uh, it's a population of only three million people. Uh, it gained independence from the Soviet Union, uh, well, at the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990. They went cold turkey. They went from being a Soviet satellite state to being a parliamentary democracy with, a, with an open economy and a free market economy overnight. The birthing process was, has been quite traumatic, but it has been consistently electing uh, free governments ever since 1990. Uh, enormous mineral wealth was discovered by Australian companies and Canadian companies. And now there are 45 Australian companies with a presence in Mongolia. Uh, primarily being lured by mining. Uh, Rio Tinto is uh, about to open one of, the, uh, one of the world's biggest copper gold deposits in the South Gobi Desert, just near the, the Chinese border. But they also have enormous uh, coal deposits, and Australian companies are part of the process of, of mining, of engineering, of designing, uh, again, 
primarily service exports, but there's a large Australian presence there. So that's why we're in places like Mongolia. So I mentioned that I discovered Austrade uh, back in 1997, wound up my own business and uh, applied. Luckily, no one else applied, and, and I was uh, uh, my first job with Austrade was as the consul and trade commissioner in Sendai, where the earthquake and, and tsunami was uh, back in, uh, in 2011. Um, that was a four-year contract. I had every intention of doing that four-year contract and getting back into business, but I quite like the work that we do in Austria. Every day is different, and it's always uh, interesting with the, with the variety of companies that we assist. So the reasons why we would have offices in regional Japan are that whilst the Japanese economy is now, well, it's now the third biggest economy in the world, then it was the second biggest economy in the world, but each of those regions was roughly a GDP or a gross regional product of roughly the same size as the whole of Australia. But it's difficult for Australian companies to get into regional Japan. So the theory behind Austrade is that we can use the badge of government, as we describe it, to, uh, to assist Australian companies. So you, you might have picked up that I mentioned that as well as being a trade commissioner, I was also a consul. So, does anyone know the difference between a consulate and an embassy? Everyone's either very shy or they probably don't know. And that's probably excusable. Not a lot of people do know. A good way to explain what a consulate general is, is to explain how Japan was opened up by the West in 1868. The Commodore Matthew Perry from the US Navy stormed into Yokohama Bay, um, the, the end of the shogunate uh, period in Japan just wilted in the face of the big guns of, uh, of the US Navy and, and acquiesced and decided to open up to, to the West. That's a pot of food and a very complex issue, but the first thing that they did was to establish a consulate general. And the consul general, was responsible, he was given diplomatic privileges, and he was responsible for assisting US Navy or US sailors as they arrived. So when you arrive in port, you've been on a sailing ship uh, uh, you know, for several months, you need water, uh, you probably have sick sailors, uh, sailors go off, get drunk, get into trouble, you've got to bail them out of uh, um, prison or, or, or get them out of hospital or, or, or help them. You have to help transact the birthing of the ship and the exchange and the, uh, and the providoring of the ship for their return and journey. So that's basically what a consular does, assists traders and, and, and helps facilitate the process of doing commerce in a foreign country. Embassies, where an ambassador hangs out, uh, is, an ambassador is a representative of the government. So an ambassador uh, is always exchanged whenever we uh, send an ambassador, that other country also sends an ambassador as the, as the representative of the head of state in each other's country. So embassies also provide consular services, but in many places uh, there are consulates that, uh, that just do consular services and, and don't worry about the big matters of state that ambassadors are dealing with. So in 16 of the, of, of the 80 offices around the world, Austrade runs consular services on behalf of our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So an ambassador is always from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, but as I mentioned, 16 of the consuls general around the world are actually uh, Austrade trade commissioners. And a good example of why you would have a trade commissioner do a consul general role is actually in California. Qantas is the biggest single uh, carrier arriving in LAX, in, in Los Angeles International Airport. So DFAT has to have a major consular presence there. You know, there are lots of movie stars that need pampering and, and you know, just a lot of Australians coming and going uh, uh, in, in Los Angeles. San Francisco, however, is of course uh, where Silicon Valley is. There are a lot of Australian wine interests in Napa Valley. Uh, and, and there's roughly 15,000 Australians living there. 
that DFAT don't want to have, they can't afford to have two consulates in the same state of California. Uh, so we did a deal. And Australia said, if you let our trade commissioner also be the consul general, we'll provide the consular services, the passport renewals, you know, we'll, we'll get people uh, uh, legal assistance when they get arrested uh, and, and general consular assistance like that on behalf of Australian citizens, but so that we can use that badge of government so that the trade commissioner can be the consul general. And being a consul general means that you get invited to, well, yes, of course, you get invited to, uh, to cocktail parties. It's not all about cocktail parties. Uh, back in, this is actually in, in Sendai in North Japan. So when you're the only, uh, you, you know, Caucasian person in the room, the, the governor and the mayor and the, the head of the, uh, the federal government for that region all come and talk to you. And you know why? Why do you speak Japanese? And why are you here? And what are you doing? And so you can open up conversations. Uh, this, this particular event, we were celebrating uh, this guy getting a, uh, a like a, the equivalent of an Order of Australia, the, the Order of the Chrysanthemum in Japan, um, for his services to industry. So he was a captain of industry in this particular region, factories all over the world, importing and exporting all over the world, and. As Consul General, I could go and talk to him and say, what does your company need to buy? What can I source from Australia to sell to your factories, either here in Japan or elsewhere around the world? And having that, uh, that badge of government meant that I could take Australian companies in to a company, uh, a, Japan, a local Japanese company, and because I'm there, uh, rather than the Australian company sort of lining up for uh, you know, for a half a day to see if you can get into purchasing manager number three division of a big company. The chairman, if you know how a Japanese uh, meeting is organised, the chairman at the head of the table comes to sit in on the meeting. So the CEO's got to come as well. And the chief buyer uh, comes and pays attention. And it means that we can, we can get into, we can get Australian companies into the decision making level of, uh, of Australian of Australian businesses. Um, so, so that's a little bit of a flavour about what Austrade does. We are the facilitator of trade and commerce. Uh, the, the theory behind it is that the tyranny of distance means that it's very difficult for Australian companies to engage in those markets. Um, but you've heard and you've read, as part of your assigned uh, reading, things about the Asian century. Now, this was an initiative, it was a white paper that was called for by the Gillard government uh, at the time. And, and it was quite an interesting process. It was a whole of government process. The Department of Prime, uh, uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet led it. And every federal government agency uh, had to contribute. But also, as a white paper, it called for contributions from all sectors of, of industry and society. So it was a comprehensive uh, Australian government-led initiative to try and capture our thoughts about how we would react to some of the things that are happening in Asia and, and what is happening in Asia. Um, things like, words like urbanisation, and I understand that's something that... Uh, that you are looking at in your course. The, the, a, a, as China moves from the provinces into urban areas, what happens to rural China? What happens to urban China? As you see millions of people moving into, uh, moving into cities. As, as incomes rise, what happens to lifestyles? As incomes rise uh, and people start in, in regional China, people start buying things, they start using e-commerce. There isn't even enough time for them to set up an actual storefront. We, we struggle in Australia about whether David Jones and Myers are going to survive because of the threat of e-commerce. You know, you can buy, you, you can buy a tie on, a, you know, on eBay while you're sitting at home watching the footy. Uh, why would you bother going to David Jones to buy a time? Uh, in, in Western China, they don't even bother building the retail outlet 
because people just buy online. A whole industry is growing around the delivery of the tie or the suit or the dress to somebody's apartment. The value add for doing that is not just a delivery process, but they wait, try it on, fit it, work out where it needs to be taken in. The value add is is for this delivery guy to then take it to his friend the tailor, who tail you know who who uh, uh, brings it to size, and then he re-delivers it at the end of the day. Now that is an interesting commercial development that we're uh, that we're observing. So look the the the. The gov governments of, of all persuasions put badges on these things. It was quite a, a catch cry at the time. Um, a question was put to me uh, in, in preparing for this uh, seminar, what's happened to the Asian century? Well, I put to you a couple of things. One is um, uh, we started our Asian century. We started focusing on Asia as a country, and the Australian government was supporting Australian industry uh, in Asia from very early in the last century. So from what we do, in some ways there's nothing new, but in other ways there is a redoubling of our efforts to help Australian companies not only focus on Asia, but really understand what it means to export to Asia and, and to the different parts of Asia. So just talking about the different parts of Asia um, and and in Asia alone, Austrade has, I've tried to count this morning, I think it's 41 uh, offices. In, in China, we have 11 offices and we have about 80 staff. Uh, today, in fact, is the first day of the Trade and Investment Minister's uh, 668 delegate uh, mega mission to China. So over the, over the news over the next few days, you're going to be seeing lots of uh, shots of uh, Minister Rob, Andrew Rob, uh, in China with uh, 668 of his closest friends. All Australian, sec we, we've got seven sectoral themed breakout uh, tours all around China this week. It's, it's one of the biggest ever trade shows run by, uh, by the Australian government. Um, the One of, the, one of the curious little catchphrases that came out of that white paper as it was written was that uh, no longer is Australia constrained by the tyranny of distance of you know, the 1800s and the early 1900s, the long way uh, away our markets were. Now we're empowered by the proximity of, uh, of our markets. But Austrade's job now is to help Australian companies really focus on understanding what it means and how to take advantage of, of, uh, of the markets. And in many ways, you know, Asia, as you just look at that map again, uh, you know, what people are doing up in Sapporo and what people are doing in, we, we call it Asia, but it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's quite an artificial construct. Uh, you know, the, the differences, the extremes of Ulaanbaatar and Jakarta, um, you know, the extremes of Karachi and, and Sapporo um, are, are enormous. What does that mean from a commercial point of view? More importantly, it's not just Australia's Asian century, it's Asia's Asian century. The inter-regional inter trade uh, between Asian countries as they, uh, as they all in 80, income per, uh, per person in developing countries in Asia was about one thirtieth of the of the GDP, uh, or, sorry, of the uh, average income of the US. Um, by, by 2025, I reckon that that gap will no longer be one thirtieth, but be a quarter. Uh, so as, as Asia becomes the, the, the largest uh, middle class of the world, this is really going to transform uh, the way the rest of the world operates. Um, it's going to be our most populous region, of course. It's going to be our, our biggest economic zone. It's our, it'll be the biggest zone of consumption the world has ever seen. And, and of course, uh, the world's biggest middle class. 
for that other than uh, world's largest middle class. Uh, and, and, and this is the intra-Asia trade. Uh, so it's not just us getting lucky because we're near Asia. Uh, everyone in Asia is looking at Asia as well. So we need to be doubly uh, uh, um, effective. Um, so 60% of the world's demand for agribusiness, agri-food, is going to come from Asia. Um, so this is, this is an opportunity, a great opportunity for us. And you hear lots of talk about Australia becoming the food bowl of Asia. But curiously, uh, you know, the rest of the world is trying to get into Asia as well. Our biggest competitors are trying to get into Asia. And uh, we're already seeing evidence of Australia losing market share. Uh, our, our closest neighbours in New Zealand are brilliant at marketing. And, and they are stealing market share from us in, in areas of comparative advantage because they tend to market their products and themselves better than, uh, than we tend to uh, in Australia. The, uh, so not only is it agricultural products, but there are other niche areas as well around agriculture where there are great opportunities for Australian companies consultancy services. They, they talk about the Chinese wine market. Uh, China is so large and covers such a, a, a diverse geographic and climatic region that they estimate that China would probably be able to reproduce a Barossa Valley or a Burgundy region quite easily given the right advice. So this is opportunity for Australian winemakers uh, to help as the, as the <coughs> Chinese uh, wine drinker and wine consumer matures in its taste and understanding of, uh, of the manufacturer and, and, and production of, of wine, uh, will China become one of the main uh, uh, wine producers of the world? We look at our exports um, of these food and beverage exports. Japan is by far our largest and with the announcement of the free trade agreement last night, uh, we see enormous growth, particularly in beef, uh, and other processed foods uh, and uh, as, as tariffs have dropped over the next few years. Uh, of these 16 our top export markets for food and beer, 11 of those are in Asia already. Energy. So Asia by 2035 will be consuming 43% of the world's energy. What does that mean for Australia's coal exports? What does that mean for the uh, clean energy sector? What does it mean for global warming? <clears throat> Urbanisation will also mean, uh, uh, and, and the change in the demographics mean terrific opportunities for medical and health imports. So life expectancies will grow. Uh, people will be able to afford better medicines. They'll have better access to better medicines. They'll demand uh, better treatment at hospitals. So aged care uh, is an area, a sector, which is going to show enormous growth. Uh, I mentioned the, the ageing uh, demographic. Uh, China's one-child policy, the impact of that, the, the number of tax-paying uh, contributors to the Chinese economy is going to be enormously uh, uh, eroded relative to the aged population who are going to live longer because they're going to have better medicine and better food uh, and, and better housing and, and, and safer uh, and a safer environment for the living. I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure. Uh, and I understand this is an element of, of the course that you're doing. The, and I wish I put this slide in, and I can't quite remember the statistics, but the Seine, the Seine River in, in Paris, I think there are 37 bridges and tunnels across that river. There's only 10 uh, crossing the, the uh, uh, whatever the main river in Shanghai is. Uh, when you look at the population stress, as people commute, um, the opportunities for infrastructure are enormous. But Austrade's job is really to help Australian companies understand that opportunity. 
It, it doesn't mean that every Australian engineering company is going to be out there building bridges. Um, and we need to look at our comparative advantage. Maybe we're better at building gravel roads in the deserts of Mongolia to help ship the coal and copper across the border into China uh, than we are trying to compete with all the North American or, or, um, uh, or European country, uh, companies trying to win business to build bridges in Shanghai. Another statistic uh, from the ADB estimates that uh, Asia needs $8 trillion in infrastructure investment uh, by 2020. That's, uh, that's just a remarkable statistic. So what, how does Australia respond to this? Where are our niches? And this is uh, a big part of the work that Australia is doing. A as we look at Australian companies who can no longer afford to be complacent and look at manufacturing in Australia, putting product in containers and shipping it overseas, uh, the, the impact of high dollars, the relatively high wages in Australia will make it uncompetitive. So we are working with Australian companies to help them look at alternative strategies. And one of those alternative strategies is to look at the supply chains. As our own automotive sector is, uh, is, is being costed out and being closed down and wound down over the next few years in Australia, uh, cars are still being produced. Uh, more and more cars are being produced. More and more cars will be produced just to cope with the rising uh, economies of, of, of China, for example. So we look at how we can help Australian companies position themselves in Thailand so that they can supply their equipment into the manufacture of Chinese or Korean cars in, in China. And sometimes that involves going beyond the low risk strategy of just uh, joint marketing or, or, or supply from a container and waving goodbye at the wharf, as has been the case uh, we need to do more like the Japanese firms are doing, the American firms are doing, the big international firms are doing. We need to be investing further in our downstream. Uh, a really good example of how an Australian company entered the Japanese market was Toll Holdings. They went and bought a distressed asset in Japan, a delivery business similar to their own uh, business in Japan. And, and they basically bought their own customer base and then have been working over the last few years to refine and expand uh, that business using their own systems and techniques, which uh, are obviously superior. Well, they feel they are superior, but they're, they're demonstrating that that, uh, that that strategy is being worthwhile. Higher risk, but higher reward. Um, that's pretty boring. If you're going to start a business here, that's how you do it. Same things happen internationally. I do want to touch on another aspect of, uh, of difficulty that Australian companies find uh, that is a lot more difficult and a lot more complex uh, relative to going to, say, Western Europe or, or American markets. And that is the perception, the, the corruption perception index. So it's not only that there is necessarily corruption, but it's the perception of corruption. Uh, and the really important thing to, uh, to point out here is that um, you know, corruption happens. There are different ways of doing business. But Australian companies uh, cannot fall into that trap uh, because it's now punishable in Australia or Australian com uh, companies can be punished in the US or the UK and in other countries, Canada, etc for accepting bribes, trying to make bribes, or, or dealing corruptly. So this is an extra stress and an extra difficulty uh, that Australian companies have in dealing with, uh, with Asian countries in particular. Uh, not, not that we don't have corruption in Australia as well, I should point out. Uh, you, you know, you look at uh, things happening in some countries and they look a lot like uh, New South Wales these days. But uh, I want to touch on investment, another big part of the work that Austrade does is to assist uh, Australian company, uh, 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 foreign companies invest in Australia. We have five areas in which we focus. They are to help with the needs of the Australian economy where we have big gaps. And those five areas, those five gaps are uh, tourism infrastructure, 
uh, in particular, in particular, Sydney is quite, uh, you know, the number of bids available is just not enough for this, our major gateway, world-renowned uh, city. Uh, we have insufficient uh, beds per night for, uh, for uh, across the, the full spectrum of the travelling tourist and business traveller to, to Sydney. Uh, and this is a big issue. So we're trying to help foreign hotel companies, foreign, uh, um, foreign businesses uh, invest in our tourism infrastructure. There's general infrastructure such as the, uh, the, um, the expressways and uh, uh, corridors that are being built in Sydney. Uh, we are trying to attract investment in agriculture. We're trying to attract investment in uh, resources and energy and we're also trying to, we're, we're focusing on attracting investment in innovation to help foreign companies find and use the innovative uh, uh, and, and creative and hard-working and well-educated uh, uh, labour resources we have in Australia. So that's a summary of the services that we have. Uh, we provide, whereas DFAT might do big policy papers and, and uh, think pieces, Austrade tends to be on the ground. We provide uh, advice to companies which is clearly uh, pitched to the market, relevant to the market and hopefully helps people do deals in foreign markets quicker. I mentioned that we have an export market development grant scheme as well uh, and that uh, you can read about online because we have lots of materials online. Uh, we, I, I would encourage you to look at country briefs and sectoral briefs online. Uh, of course, your lecturer will be looking at it as well, so uh, uh, you can't just cut and paste. Not that anyone would. And I should point out that whilst we have 132878, it's not available for students. But when you start a business or if you have family in, uh, uh, in, in business and, and you think that they could benefit from, uh, from Austrade assistance, feel free uh, to pass on that number and uh, we'd love to help them. And a bit of a gap there, we finished before 10, now it's open to questions.